Good morning. Now, I was a little distracted back there uh, when Keith was giving his announcement, but I thought I heard diapers lightly used, or uh, <laughs> I, is that, I, I, I'm not sure, but Keith did forget, when you bring those, they shouldn't be delivered to the church, but to his house, okay, so make sure you deliver those diapers lightly used to his house. All right, just wanted to make sure we all knew that. Anyhow, uh, my name is Paul Williams, and I am the discipleship pastor here at Central, and today uh, I have the opportunity to open up God's Word with you, and I am excited to do so. And uh, I'm going to start off by actually reading a quote, a quote from John MacArthur, and I think it'll kick things off quite well. So listen to this. John MacArthur says, throughout the universe, war rages on every front, God The holy angels and elect men battle Satan, his demonic hosts, and fallen men. Although the outcome of the war has never been in doubt, the battles are no less real. The war began on the angelic level when Lucifer, highest of the created beings, rebelled against his creator. Lucifer, more commonly known as Satan, was cast from heaven, taking with him one-third of the angels. From that moment until the present, war has raged between Satan and God, engulfing angels and men. On the human front, the battle began when Adam and Eve rebelled against God in Eden. When they sampled the forbidden fruit at the instigation of Satan, the war of the ages spread to the human realm. Through the centuries since then, men have shaken their fists in defiance at God. And though the folly of fighting him is self-evident, that does not stop each succeeding generation from trying. They pit their impotence against his omnipotence, shattering themselves like raw eggs thrown against granite. Look at what Solomon writes in Proverbs 21, 30. He says this, No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. To go toe-to-toe with Almighty God, well, that's completely hopeless. And even if man hails those who try as, as wise, they are nothing but complete fools. True wisdom lies with being on God's side. True wisdom lies in being on God's side. You know, in biblical times, just as our own, there were those who tried vainly to battle God. Many of them were kings or other rulers whose immense earthly power deceived them into thinking that they could successfully oppose heaven. In reality, they and their kingdoms, says in Isaiah 40 here, are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. In the New Testament era, one family of rulers stands out in this battle against God. And that family would be the Herods. And with that, let's begin working our way through Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at Acts chapter 12, not the whole chapter. We'll leave off one verse. So so there you go. So it's very manageable here today. Um, Let's go ahead and pray before we do so. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the privilege it is to open up your word. Here we are sitting today, standing today. That's the church of God with your word in our hands. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, challenge our hearts. May your spirit do a great work, and may you be glorified with every word that is said today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and read Acts 12, 1 through 5. We'll start there. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, 
he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So the Christians in Jerusalem had been relatively free from persecution since the death of Stephen back in Acts chapter 8. But in later years, however, we now see the church receiving a new threat, not from the religious leaders of the Jews, not from the common people, but from a person whom Luke describes as King Herod. So who was this king? Well, he was Herod Agrippa I. He was born about 10 BC, and he was grandson of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was the king at Jesus' birth and the one who ordered the infants to be killed all throughout Bethlehem. So that was his grandfather, and his grandmother was Mariamne, who was actually a Jewess. So through his grandmother, Herod Agrippa could actually claim Jewish ancestry. And and that's kind of interesting. And what we see Herod doing actually in this time period is exploiting this distinction to full advantage. For example, he he made it known to, to all that he enjoyed living in Jerusalem. This was home. And while he was there, he scrupulously observed Jewish law, and Jewish tradition. Daily, he would offer sacrifices at the temple. And actually, during the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jewish authorities gave him, Herod, the honor of reading publicly a passage from the Old Testament law. And he did so in harmony with the Mosaic law that the king would read a copy of the law all the days of his life. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 17. He was assuming that role. So in short, the Jews accepted King Herod Agrippa as one of their own. So Herod Agrippa, he he continued his scheming and decided to lay hands on several members of the church with the intention of mistreating them and thereby getting, getting even more favor with his Jewish subjects. Luke doesn't indicate how many persons were arrested, but he does mention the name of James, who was the brother of the Apostle John. In fact, Herod had the Apostle James killed by the sword. Now, the king likely here acted in collusion with the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, they served as the court of law, And we see, if we look back again in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 13, if someone entices a Jew to engage in idolatry, well, that person must be put to death by stoning. But if such a person persuades a whole city to serve other gods, then he must be killed with the sword. And that's what we see happening here to the Apostle James. In the eyes of Herod Agrippa, and I'm sure the Sanhedrin, James had led the city of Jerusalem astray and had earned himself such a punishment. Now, this would have been huge news uh, in the early church, right? This is James, James the Apostle, one of the twelve. Now, he became the first apostle to suffer martyrdom. And he was also the first apostle to die, minus Judas Iscariot, which that was kind of a different situation there. But, and he was the only one whose death is actually recorded in the whole New Testament. None of the other apostles are talked about at the time of their death. So anyhow, spurred by the approval of the Jews, I want to mention that, spurred by the approval, he liked that. Herod Agrippa decides to go all out and arrest Peter, the leader, the chief spokesman of these 12 apostles. Now, the arrest and execution of the apostle Peter, that would forever endear him 
to the Jewish people. He cunningly chose the Passover season when Jerusalem would be bustling with devout Jewish pilgrims. I mean, that city would be, would be packed. And again, this would ensure his act would be seen by the maximum amount of people. You see, Herod was a man of deep desires. And one of those was an intense desire for self-exaltation. Self-exaltation. He loved the praise of men. Especially praise that flowed as he demonstrated his kingly power and his kingly authority. Look at me. Look at my might. But what Herod didn't realize was this. Those who seek the praise of men are on a collision course with God. Those who seek the praise of men are on a collision course with God. And this will become exceedingly evident as we work our way through this text. Anyhow, Herod was determined to put Peter to death. But he wanted to delay the spectacle until after the Passover. During the Passover itself, the the people would be busy. He wanted to have his showy public trial of Peter after the busyness of the holiday, but before everybody went home. So, what does he do? He puts Peter in prison for the time being. We're just going to hold off a few more days. So Herod assigned 16 soldiers to guard Peter, four squads of four soldiers each. You can think of Peter's treatment being approximately equivalent to that of modern-day maximum security. But why would Herod keep such a close guard on, on Peter? Well, I think it's certainly possible that the Sanhedrin had informed him about the earlier arrest of all the apostles who had escaped from prison during the night. That was Acts chapter 5. Moreover, Peter himself had performed many miracles throughout Jerusalem, and he demonstrated supernatural power throughout the land. Therefore, Herod Agrippa wanted to be absolutely certain that this time Peter would not escape. As we'll soon see, Herod was failing to realize the power of God, as well as the power of prayer that the entire church wielded on Peter's behalf. That is, through the prayers of his people, God himself would intervene and show Herod that his opposition was insignificant. His opposition was completely futile. Let's continue in our account and read through verses 6 through 11. It says, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. So we see here Luke relating Peter's escape from prison in great detail. And uh, hopefully we appreciate that. God doesn't always do that. There's other escapes that there's very few details but not this time. Luke pictures the scene. He describes the actions. He records the conversations that took place in that cell. He makes every word count to heighten the effect of Peter's miraculous release. So Herod 
had scheduled Peter's trial and execution for the very next day, the day marking the conclusion of the Jewish festivities. And in accordance with Roman practice of guarding prisoners and maximum security, Herod ordered that two soldiers be chained to Peter, one on his right hand and the other on his left. There was also two sets of guards posted at the doors. So again, consequently, the possibility of escape would have been completely ruled out. However, Luke places the emphasis not on Herod, not on those soldiers, but actually on Peter. Consider Peter here. He portrays Peter sound asleep between two guards and paints a picture of complete trust, complete faith in God. Despite his appalling circumstances, Peter was sound asleep on the ground. Neither the presence of the guards, the hardness of the cell floor, the wretchedness of the prison, or the imminent threat of execution the very next day could disturb Peter's rest. And then, in the last moments, God steps in. Luke says, suddenly, suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and light shone into the cell. And then the angel strikes Peter on the side. He tries to wake him up, which wasn't even that easy because he was in such a deep sleep. I'm guessing Peter would have been a little bit confused here. Not something that happens every day. Someone standing over him, someone commanding him to get up. Wow, how could he get up? He's bound to these soldiers. But the chains had fallen off his wrists, and he was loosed. Now, Peter had occasionally received visions from God, and he assumed, I must be having another one of those visions, (laughs) because this surely can't be. As he followed the angel through the corridors of the building, so that the doors, they just opened up automatically, and the guards, they too appeared to be in a deep sleep. And finally, the last gate, the heavy gate, opened by itself. And on the other side of it was the city street that signaled freedom for the apostle Peter. So suddenly, the angel came into Peter's cell, and suddenly, that angel was gone. He left Peter while they were still walking together on the streets of Jerusalem. This angel had accomplished his task. His time was done, and he could leave. God's plan was accomplished. John Calvin remarks this. He says, God could have, you think about it, God could could have done so many things here, right? God could have transferred Peter instantaneously to the room where the believers were praying for his release. If God had removed Peter from one place to another, he would have performed only one miracle. As Luke indicates, God performs a series of miracles in releasing Peter and answering the prayers of the saints. Now, when Peter realized that the angel had disappeared, he became fully to his senses and fully knew that this was no vision. This was the hand of God. Let's continue reading here. Acts 12, 12 through 17. It says, when he realized this, okay, this is the real deal, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. There were many there gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And he departed and went to 
another place. Peter must have known that there would be believers praying for him at the house of Mary. He knew there would be some gathered together there, and he went to reveal to them what the Lord had done. He also knew that that he was a wanted man, (laughs) and he needed to get off those streets as well. So soon we find Peter standing at the outer gate of, of Mary's house here cautiously knocking. He can't make too much of a commotion, can't draw attention to himself, but he's looking for safety, looking for shelter. Let's get off the street. Next, the servant girl Rhoda fearfully approaches the gate, reluctant to open it. And, and that makes sense, right? Knocking wasn't always a good thing during these times, right? Who could it be? Is there some kind of trouble outside? And then there's the believers inside. All this is happening at the same time, right? Believers inside, weary, they're worn, yet intensely praying for Peter's release. All the while, knock, knock, knock. (laughs) Peter's at the door wanting to come in. So we see Rhoda recognizing Peter's voice. Again, she doesn't open the gate. She leaves poor Peter standing outside and in bewilderment, I'm sure, rushes back to all the people in the house, boys trembling with emotion. She she exclaims, Peter is standing outside at the gate. And they respond by saying, you are out of your mind. (laughs) That just cannot be. However, the opposite was true. Of all the people in the house, it was only Rhoda that that had kept her sanity, and she steadfastly insisted, no, it is Peter. He is here. Now, I want to remark here, I want to pause and say, it's worth noting that Luke records no words of rebuke for any kind of unbelief expressed by these Christians, and I don't think they are worthy to be attributed to unbelief at all. These Christians were praying. (laughs) They were passionate. I think what we actually see here is more of a, I'll just call it a case of the Ephesians 3.20s. Okay? Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. You see, these Christians were praying sincere and faith-filled prayers. It's just that God had answered their prayer in such a way that would be deemed unthinkable. They weren't praying like that. Well, that's not going to happen. God went beyond their wildest dreams and thoughts. And God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ever ask or think. Never underestimate the power of the Lord. When we pray, may we remember and cling to the truth that with God, all things are possible. Now you'll find throughout the book of Acts that the church is repeatedly described as praying fervently. That word is used often. Fervently when facing persecution. Let's take a look at that word for a few moments here. It's kind of interesting. It comes from the Greek word ektenos, which is actually a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Isn't that neat? The stretching of a muscle to its limits. That's what it meant to pray fervently. The same Greek word is used as Jesus was praying fervently in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? As his sweat became drops of blood falling down upon the ground, he was praying fervently. There is no doubt that the church poured the maximum effort they were capable of into their prayers for Peter, and there was no lack of faith. Listen to this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this, it was a great wonder that the infant church of Christ was not destroyed. Truly, she was like a lone lamb in the midst of furious wolves, without either earthly power or prestige or patronage to protect her. Yet, 
as though she wore a charmed life, she escaped from the hosts of her cruel foes. It is worthwhile asking, however, with what weapons did this church protect herself? For we may very wisely use the same. She was preserved in her utmost danger from overwhelming destruction. What was her defense? Where found she shield and buckler? The answer is in prayer. Many were gathered together praying. You see, the early church was a church of prayer. And while praying, as we look back to the book of Acts, while praying, the Spirit of God came down upon them. While praying, the Spirit often separated this man for this work and this man for another. While praying, their hearts grew warm with inward fire. While praying, their tongues were unloosed and they went forth to speak to the people with all boldness. And while praying, the Lord opened to them the treasures of his grace. You see, by prayer, they were protected. And by prayer, they grew. And if our modern churches are to live and to grow, they too must be watered from that same source, prayer. Now, the private Christian, he will read, he will listen, he will hear, he will meditate, but none of these can be a substitute for prayer. As one preacher put it, let us pray is one of the most needful watchwords which I can suggest to Christian men and women. And now before I leave the topic of prayer, there's so much good material to get into. I want to leave you and challenge our souls with one more quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this, Never sunder the connection between your soul and God. Keep up a constant communication with heaven, or your communication with earth will be of little worth. To cease from prayer is to stop the vital stream upon which all your energy is dependent. You may go on preaching and teaching and giving away tracts and what you like, but nothing can possibly come of it when the power of Almighty God has ceased to be with you. Again, prayer. Consider these words. Let's go back to our text here. You know, eventually the Christians realized it was Peter, right? It was Peter standing outside. They opened the door, they saw him, and with utter amazement, they welcomed him into their midst. Fear, tension, I mean, it was gone, right? Instantly vanished, and that gave place to laughter, happiness, joy, gratitude to God. These moments of elation, they couldn't last for long though, right? Time was of the essence here. Peter was a wanted man. And in verse 17, Luke says that Peter went out and he departed to another place, presumably a place outside of Jerusalem. Let's read verses 18 and 19 here the next day, the morning of, right? Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance. It's funny how they put that, isn't it? No little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. I mean, can you imagine the commotion of the next morning? Think of the two soldiers waking up after their night's sleep, lifting up their arms, scratching their head, and uh (laughs) uh-oh. They are still bound. They are still chained, but Peter is gone. They knew that the Roman law stipulated the death penalty for guards who permitted their prisoners to escape. The guards at the doors were in the same predicament. They were also filled with fear because they, too, could be killed. I'm sure there's chatter and talking amongst each other. What happened? What are we going to do? 
Now the news of Peter's escape, it spread quickly, and within a short time, it had reached King Herod himself. And as the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, he immediately ordered his soldiers to make a diligent search for Peter. We have to find this man. Now surely the soldiers searched the houses of prominent believers. Surely they questioned numerous Christians about Peter's escape and his whereabouts. However, the search proved to be futile. Peter had already left. The guards, well, they were then ordered to appear before Herod, and they were soon led away to their execution. After Peter's miraculous escape, Herod would leave the Jewish capital, and he took residence in Caesarea. You know, maybe he just needed a little vacation after all the events of the previous few days, or maybe he had just had enough of these Christians and their God. But Herod, Herod didn't go away humbly. Herod was as prideful as ever. Not only that, Herod had lifted up his hand against God's people, and God wasn't about to let him alone just yet. In Caesarea, Herod would experience God's divine judgment. Listen to verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, and he took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him him down because he did not give god the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last but the word of god increased and multiplied so what we read here is first of all herod has been angry with these cities tyre and sidon it's a little bit of a side note here but i think it'll make sense in a second but these inhabitants of these two harbor cities. Now, they were, they were rivals of Caesarea in the world of commerce. They could compete in that way, but for their food supply, being on the coast, they were lacking. They were lacking, and they depended on Israel's grain harvests so they could eat. Now, we assume that Herod denied them access to Israel's grain markets, and that made their lives miserable. To not eat would be miserable. (laughs) In short, what Herod was doing was conducting some kind of economic warfare on these two cities. So the residents there, they soon have had enough. They liked eating, and they were growing desperate, and now they were at the point, they didn't have a problem kissing up to Herod. They were going to say, and they were going to do whatever it took to get things back to the status quo. And that's exactly what happened at the speech that Herod was about to give. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus, um, he relates that Herod Agrippa had come to Caesarea to celebrate a festival held in honor for the Roman emperor Claudius. So he's there. This festival's going on. This festival consisted of games that were held every five years. And on the second day uh, of the games, Josephus tells us that Herod entered the arena at daybreak. And just try to picture this in all his pomp and in all his pride. Josephus writes that he was dressed in a garment woven from silver thread. And when the first rays of the sun touched his cloak, Herod was illumined by the sun's reflected light. He wanted to give an awesome appearance. Look at me in all my glory. Now, Josephus continues to write and says this. He said, straightway, so as this is happening, as he comes out, straightway his flatterers raised their voices from various directions, though hardly for his own good, addressing him, Herod, as a god. 
May you be propitious to us, they added. And if we have hitherto feared you as a man, yet henceforth we agree that you are more than mortal in your being. The king did not rebuke them, nor did he reject their flattery as impious. You see, this type of speech, it was music to Herod's ears. And being such a prideful man, he most definitely welcomed such adoration. Herod couldn't get enough of it, yet God had had enough of Herod. In those very moments, God publicly punished Herod Agrippa for accepting honors that were due to God himself and God alone. Luke graphically describes Herod's demise by saying that he was eaten by worms died. He therefore would have suffered an extremely painful and utterly despicable end. John Calvin comments that Herod's body reeked because of decay so that he was nothing more than a living carcass. Some ancient sources also describe this excruciating death of being consumed by worms. On one such account, It refers to Herod as a tyrant who had persecuted the Jews and who therefore was struck with an incurable disease. The source goes on and it writes, And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms. And while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away. And because of his stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. Josephus supplies the information, more information, and says that Herod actually lived with this condition for five miserable days before he died. He writes, in the 54th year of his life, in the seventh year of his reign, he died. He died in A.D. 44 as the epitome of pride and a great persecutor of the church, he came to a shameful death relatively soon after he had killed James and incarcerated Peter. Can't help but think of Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Was it ever more applicable than in this situation? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And great was Herod's fall. After Herod's death, the Roman emperor appointed a a governor to rule the land of the Jews. And Christians once again enjoyed freedom from persecution. And as a result, the church continued to increase numerically. And they continued to grow in the grace of God. So Acts chapter 12. Right? It began with Herod killing the apostle James, and it ends with the angel of the Lord killing Herod. One could say that the main point of the chapter is this. If you oppose Jesus, you will ultimately lose. You will lose. Luke put this chapter together to make this plain for the early church. They may have felt small, they may have felt insignificant in the Roman, the big Roman Empire. They may have thought that that they could be overpowered when some of their best leaders were killed on a political whim. But the truth is, if you stay with Jesus, you will win. And if you oppose Jesus, you will lose. The early church could be encouraged. The early church could be bold and courageous to spread the word of truth and then leave the outcome to God. And I believe these same truths hold firm for the church of modern day. They hold true and firm for us. And may we bask in those truths here this morning. You know, 2,000 years ago, God took on flesh in the person of God the Son, Jesus Christ. And he told people, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in 
the gospel. Now, where there is a kingdom, there must be a king. The king, God himself, was coming soon. And if you are not prepared to fight this king, well, Jesus is telling us you better do whatever it takes to be at peace with him when he comes. Again, if you stay with Jesus, you win. And if you oppose him, you will lose. And it will be costly. Now, I don't know about you, but I have no interest in fighting against the God of the Bible. I have no interest in opposing the one who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who has humbled king and empire over and over and over again. The most mighty men the world has ever seen have come to nothing. I will not oppose this God. Jesus says we must repent in preparation of this king's coming. He is coming. He says repent. Repent means to turn. Jesus was telling his hearers to turn. It has the idea of changing direction. You're going this way. You need to stop and go this way. You need to go the other direction. Stop thinking how you think. Stop living how you're living. Stop doing what you're doing and turn around and look to me. Look into my glorious face. Jesus also is saying that we must believe in the gospel. Believe the good news that Jesus himself paid the penalty for our sins and now offers eternal salvation to all those who trust in him as their savior. So I have to ask, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that what Jesus accomplished at the cross was sufficient to save you? Well, Jesus is clear. Scripture is clear. Those who repent, those who turn and look to Jesus, believe the gospel, they will be saved from the wrath of God to come. And they will dwell forever in God's eternal kingdom. But Scripture is also equally clear on what will happen to those who don't. They will lose. They will lose it all. They will face the fury and the wrath of a glorious and holy God for all eternity in a literal place called hell. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We think Herod had it bad. We were grossed out. The worms, the decay, the destruction of his body, that is nothing compared to the eternal judgment of God to come upon sin and upon an unbelieving world. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is coming. Repent and believe in the gospel, and that very statement echoes through our churches today and throughout the world. May each and every one of us here find true and complete victory in Jesus Christ. Now, for those who have found just that, we're going to spend a few moments here, and we're going to close our service out by celebrating our salvation through Jesus Christ by partaking in communion. And as we do so, I pray that we would lay down all remnants of pride that has crept into our lives. God is glorious. What do we have to offer? We are nothing before Almighty God. God is glorious. Lay our pride down, for we have nothing to offer Him. Come to Him humbly. There is no room for pride at the Lord's table. Jesus is our all in all. So I pray we would examine ourselves, confess any unrepentant sin, go before the Lord, go before the God who forgives. Remember and cling to the hope of your salvation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ.
And if you have not trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, the Bible is clear in saying that you should not partake in this practice that we call communion. But even so, I want to say again, we would love to talk to you after the service. We would love to proclaim, me and many in this room, to proclaim who Jesus is and all that Jesus has done. (coughs) But before we proceed with communion, let's all spend some time in, in a quiet reflection. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for partaking. So take a few moments. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you as we remember your body broken for us, your blood shed for us. Lord, you took upon yourself the sins of the world, and we now, Lord, take upon ourselves your perfect righteousness. We, through the cross, can stand holy and blameless before God the Father. We thank you, we love you, we adore you. We pray you would help us to kill all manners of pride and self-exaltation, Lord. May we humbly confess our sins before you. And may we understand with all of our heart the only thing that makes us anything is the reality that we can be a child of God, covered in your blood. Father, we thank you for this time of remembrance. We give you glory and we pray In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And when he comes, may we be found on the right side, the winning side. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time in your word. Lord, please, may we apply these truths to our hearts. May they not go in one ear and out the other, but may we have a big view of who you are. May we have a great understanding of your power and might. May we understand, Lord, that even even today, as political forces can, can rise up and, and can intimidate and scare, may we understand, Lord, that just as in the early church, you are on your throne, you are all-powerful, you are in control, and if we stick with you, if we stand with Christ, we will ultimately win the war. God, thank you so much for your great sacrifice. We love you. We pray that our lives would be a living sacrifice of glory unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.